This podcast may contain content that is graphic and disturbing in nature. Listener discretion is advised. A weekend camping trip with family ended in tragedy when a 36-year-old mother of two turned heads as she drove erratically on the wrong side of a major roadway. Her actions would cause a horrific accident that would expose secrets and cause a family divide. This is the Diane Schuler story. Megan. Hey, Aang. What's happening? I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy to finally be out of midterms. Oh, man. I'm still feeling the grading, uh, you know, the grading exhaustion. But yes. yeah, I'm glad that we're moving past that. And... It's okay. Things will get quiet as we enter into family gathering season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> There's no prep for Thanksgiving or end of semester then. No. no. All right. One well, step at a time, right? Yes. Before we get started, Megan, we want to thank Sydney Anderson for her help with today's research. Oh, thanks so much, Sydney. That's all the business today. Now let's get back to today's story. Diane Schuler was born Diane Hans on November 13, 1972 in Floral Park, New York. She was the eldest sibling in a family that had three younger brothers. The family was working class and lived a pretty comfortable life in a quiet suburban neighborhood until when Diane was just nine years old, her mother abruptly abandoned the family. Ouch. Yeah. And at this point, since she was the only female in the family, her dad quickly relied upon her. Again, she was only nine years old, but she soon became the caregiver for her younger siblings and also ran the house and cooked the meals for the family. She basically became a homemaker at the young age of nine. This clearly must have been traumatizing to Diane, as it would be for any child. This was likely a very painful time in her life. She didn't talk about it very much. Some reports did say that many years later, I'm not sure how many years, but her mother did attempt to rekindle her relationship with all of her children. And remember, she had three brothers, but Diane was the only child in the family who refused to have her mother back into her life. So yeah, I don't, there's probably a lot of resentment there. I was going to say, I think this shows that clearly she had maybe resentment, anger, and she wasn't you know, looking to forgive very much. Although dealing with the abandonment of her mother, Diane did quite well in school and she had many friends. Again, she wouldn't discuss what had happened to her in childhood. She just kind of moved on with her life. She was enrolled at Nassau Community College on Long Island. Ah, I went there for a summer. You did? Yeah, and my mom actually took classes there too. Oh, I always forget that you lived there. Yeah. It was here that she met Daniel Schuler, whom she would later marry. Now, Daniel had a career as a public safety officer in Nassau County, and Diane worked as a cable TV executive, and she was the breadwinner of the family. The couple bought a home together in West Babylon, New York. Megan, I believe this is close to where you grew up. West Babylon is about 10 minutes from where my mom lives right now. Uh, a, a little nice, bit further from where I grew up. But yeah, nice suburb. Nice yeah. little community. Yeah, definitely. In 2004, the couple had their first child, a son named Brian. And then three years later, they had a daughter named Emma, who was born in 2007. As far as I could find, they lived a happy, quiet life. And according to those who knew her, Diane Schuler was just an all-around great person. She always seemed happy. She was one of those people who could just seemingly do it all. Remember, she had a very demanding job. She was a top executive, but somehow she was also a very present mother and always there for her children. Many sources say they always look very well put together, and she often did activities with them. Some of Diane's family members even described her, quote, super mom personality as a way of dealing with her tough upbringing. Not surprisingly, given what we know about Diane, she was a bit of a perfectionist. and She liked things a certain way, but, you know, no one had a bad thing to say about Diane. Mm -hmm. In 2009, when the event we are discussing took place, Diane was 36 years old. Her son, Brian, was five years old and her daughter, Erin, was two years old. On July 24th, 2009, Diane and Daniel left for a camping trip headed to Hunter Lake Campground in Parksville, New York. With them were their two children, Emma and Brian, and their three nieces, Emma, who was eight years old, Allison, who was seven years old, and Katie, who was five years old. These children's father was Warren Hans, who was Diane's brother, and Jackie Hans, who was Diane's sister-in-law. It was a normal, fun-filled weekend for the group. They went swimming, boating, you know, the dog was there, you know, they, had, they were having a great time. That Sunday morning on the 26th, the family woke up early around 7 a.m. and started packing up to head back home. Her nieces were supposed to be home before noon because they had some sort of recital to attend. So they were kind of getting a move pretty early. 
And, you know, it's a lot to pack up when you go camping. Can you imagine with five kids camping? No, because I can. I know how much it is with just us when the four of us go yeah. and we bring the dog. Yeah, it's a lot. So Diana and Daniel piled the five kids into Warren's red 2004 Ford Windstar. Diane had borrowed her brother's minivan for the trip because, again, she has these five young kids with her. Daniel drove his truck, which would have the family dog in it and also be towing the family's boat. So they were, you know, going in two cars. Now, they all left the campground around 930 a.m. While on the road, Diane, with the five kids, made several stops as they normally would. They stopped at a McDonald's and they stopped at several gas stations. So let's talk about this McDonald's for a minute. The first stop was a nearby McDonald's in Liberty, New York. And this was just before 10 a.m. They had ordered breakfast and the kids played on, you know, that playground thing? Yeah, McDonald's inside the McDonald's, like the little tubes that you go through and whatnot. And this was pre-COVID, so it was okay to play in those things. Right. I was just thinking germs. (laughs) Yeah, right. Witnesses and CCTV would both support the notion that Diane was acting normal at this time. Okay. She also got food and a drink there? She got a large coffee and a large orange juice. Mm. So keep that in mind. I'm not sure if she got food because there were some mixed reports, but... I wasn't concerned about food. I was thinking the orange juice, but go ahead. So you've heard this story before. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's okay. Clearly. (laughs) Next, around 1045, CCTV footage captured Diane at a nearby gas station, Mini Mart, where she reportedly asked the clerk for gel cap pain relievers, such as Tylenol. However, they did not carry the product she was looking for. Now, on this footage, she appears pretty normal. She looks a little aggravated, but to me, not at all impaired. But there's no sound, so you can't really judge it. But everyone, as always, we urge you to look it up. You can see it online. The camera does record her quickly, some say hastily, leaving the parking lot. She never actually got gas. So she clearly made this stop in search for either these gel caps or something else. Again, there's no sound, so we don't really know. A bit after 11.30 a.m., Emma, the oldest niece, called her father, Warren, on Diane's phone to report that they were running a bit late. At this time, he had also spoken briefly with Diane, and he said everything sounded normal. Around the same time, however, around 11.30, 12, there were multiple reports from other motorists on the highway that a minivan was driving aggressively. And we're talking tailgating other cars, flashing its headlights honking its horn, actually holding down the horn. Wow. Yeah, driving in between lanes. So someone looked like they were really in a rush to get somewhere or driving very erratically. There were other reports of seeing a minivan pulled over on the side of the highway with a woman bent over vomiting. And this was all within the same time frame, 11, 30, 12. Strangely, however, at 12.08, Jackie Hance, Warren's wife and the mother of the girls in the car, called Diane and reportedly spoke to her briefly for a little under two minutes. And she recalled that the conversation was, quote, normal. So this is a bit conflicting. Not long after this call, between 12.15 and 12.45, there were several other 911 calls that came in reporting, again, this red minivan driven by a woman who matched Diane's description, weaving aggressively in and out of traffic. And similar to earlier calls, they reported that the car was holding down the horn, driving aggressively, straddling lanes. Something's going on here. They also received another call that was from someone calling in that a woman who matched Diane's description was seen sitting on a guardrail right before the Tappan Zee Bridge. You know where that is, right? Yeah. Well, actually, now it's been replaced by the Mario Cuomo Bridge across the Hudson River. Mm-hmm. This witness said that this woman appeared unwell. She was bending down with her hands on her knees. Another caller said they saw her at a nearby rest area in a similar stance, you know, bending down, vomiting. Right before 1 p.m., someone dialed a wrong number from Diane's phone. It's not clear who dialed this. We don't know if it was a child dialing a number trying to get help or if it was Diane who maybe um, was impaired and couldn't figure out how to dial the phone. We'll never know, unfortunately. But a few minutes later, Emma called her father again, except this phone call was a bit different. This time she was in a panic. She told her father that Diane was incoherent, having difficulty seeing. She was confused and that they were lost. During this call, Emma stated, quote, there's something wrong with Aunt Diane. Ah, uh, you know that's where, where that came yes. from. Okay. So that's now the title of the gripping HBO documentary on this case, which I urge you all to watch. Have you seen it? I've only held off because I knew you were covering this case. Yes, okay. But when you leave tonight, I'll probably watch it. Okay, good. During this call, when she states there's something wrong with Aunt Diane, the parents heard the children crying in the background, and then the call dropped unexpectedly. Could you imagine the horror? Having zero control, hearing your children and your niece and nephew crying in the background and your daughter in a panic, 
and not knowing what is going on. No, I can't. And also because things had seemed so normal up to that time. So it would be even more panic. What do you mean? Everything was just fine like 20 minutes ago. How could something drop on the dime so fast? Yeah, Yeah, and that's kind of one of the big mysteries here is what happened in those few minutes or... Was Diane faking? The reason I say that is, was Diane acting at some point? Because she got on the phone and described feeling disoriented and sounded like she was slurring. Remember, they had just spoken to her not long before and she sounded absolutely fine. On the phone, she told Warren that she was having foggy vision and Warren told her to pull over, stay off the road, stay where you are, I'm going to come and meet you. Emma got back on the phone to try to help her dad figure out where they were. Now, remember, she's only eight years old. She's young, but luckily she's old enough to at least be able to read some nearby signs that help figure out where they are so he can get to them. Mm -hmm. Now, that call lasted approximately eight minutes. And around the same time, the minivan passed through the Tappan Zee toll plaza. Wait, so she was driving even though he told her not to? She was driving. At some point during this call, she did pull over to an area... You know, like where they have like concrete barriers. It's almost like a pull off. Yeah. Pretty narrow on the side of the road. As would later be discovered, Diane left her phone neatly on this concrete barrier right before going through the Tappan Zee Bridge. So it's almost, you know, she kind of pulls over just past the toll plaza. Her phone is placed and then she drives off. Now, was this intentional? Many people have speculated because it looked like it wasn't thrown. It was placed. Is it because Diane didn't want to deal with talking to anyone anymore? Is it because she got ill and left her phone there by accident. Nobody really knows, but a passerby does find the phone and turns it into the police eventually. That is bizarre. Yeah, and I cannot imagine how panicked the Hanses are at this point as they get in their car to try to figure out where Diane and the children are. Meanwhile, of course, they call 911 for help. Warren had called Diane's phone dozens of times, but it had gone straight to voicemail. These poor people. I know. And at the same time, meanwhile, chaos was erupting in the car as the situation got even worse. How to get worse? Well, sometime after 1.30 p.m., Diane turned onto an exit ramp headed in the wrong direction for the Taconic Parkway. Now, this is a large, busy parkway. Right. And there were many signs, do not enter. You know how you see on ramps, it'll say wrong way, do not enter. But she just goes, she drives southbound against traffic for almost two miles. Oh, my God. Can you imagine driving, going 70, 80 miles an hour and seeing a car coming towards you? So luckily, dozens of cars were able to swerve out of her way and dodge this speeding car. Now 911's getting several more calls. People are honking their horns at Diane. They're attempting to get her attention. They're calling 911. People are panicked. And many witnesses say she was staring straight ahead. She looked very determined and driving with intent. Now, Diane went up to 85 miles per hour at times. Wow. Going in the wrong direction. She was driving erratically, meaning, you know, honking the horn and flashing lights and doing all this. But she wasn't, when you think of like a drunk driver kind of going in and out of lanes, It she seemed like she was able to stay on a straight path. Tragically, at 1.35, the minivan collided head on with an SUV that was carrying three men. The men in this car were Michael Bastardi, 81 years old, his son Guy Bastardi, 49 years old, and their family friend, Daniel Longo, who was 74 years old. Now, the men were all from nearby Yonkers, and they were on their way to a family party. All three men died on impact. Oh, my goodness. A second car was also hit, but luckily, the occupants only suffered minor injuries. There were several witnesses to the crash and several cars that pulled over immediately to get out of their cars to try and help get Diane and the kids out of the car. The car was starting to catch fire, and people knew that they needed to act fast because they quickly saw there were several children piled in the back of this minivan. So they started pulling out the children, most of them unresponsive. They were pulling them out one by one, and they actually almost missed Brian. Remember the boy, the, Diane's older son, Brian, because he was buried under his sister and his cousins. It is so heartbreaking to hear the accounts of the eyewitnesses, whom of all in the documentary are hysterical, explaining this scene. It's, and, of course, there's photos from the scene. It's just horrific. It's an extremely traumatic event for anyone who witnessed this. Yeah, and all the first responders, as they're retelling, you know, everyone's just, they can't tell the story without crying. When they pulled Diane Schuler out, it was quickly noticed that there was a large bottle of absolute vodka that was broken on the driver's side floor. Now, this information would have come in handy later during the investigation, not to spoil anything, but I think it's clear what's going on here. Or what people are thinking. Absolutely. Now, this accident was massive. And I don't know if you recall, I know you lived in the area during this, but I remember it being like breaking news. There were shutdowns of several major roadways in the area. You believe I don't remember this at all? Really? No. In fact, it was Westchester County's worst accident in over 75 years. 
And you could see footage of the backups. Like we're talking hours and hours. They closed down major highways. Seven of the 11 people involved were pronounced dead at the scene, including Diane, two of her nieces, her daughter Erin, and the three men in the truck that I referenced earlier. Investigators at the scene believe that Diane and her two nieces and her daughter were likely killed instantly. The children were not secure in their car seats in the back of the car. Now, that could be because the force kind of ripped them out of the car seats. It's unclear if they were out of the seats to begin with. Okay. Shuler's son Brian and one of her nieces were initially the only survivors of the crash. Unfortunately, however, her niece was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital, but her son Brian suffered severe head trauma, several broken bones, but he did survive. So all th- they lost all three kids. Um, the other lost. family. Oh yeah, the God. other family lost all three kids. Now, Ugh. Brian says the only thing he remembered from the accident was that his mommy's head hurt and she couldn't see and that he, quote, flew out of the car like Superman. Oh, my God. And you can see this little boy in the documentary. He has long-lasting issues from the accident. He now suffers from ocular nerve palsy and some other issues. But he's alive, so. Right. After finding out about the horrific fatal crash, nobody could believe that Diane would be responsible for this. So all fingers were pointed towards her, of course, because they found this vodka. All the witness accounts showed, you know, everything was leading everyone to this one conclusion that Diane drove drunk and killed all of these people. Mm -hmm. However, her husband, Daniel, did not believe that his wife had the capability of doing anything like this. He insisted that she must have suffered from some sort of undefined medical condition that would be able to explain her unexplainable actions that Mm -hmm. day. And he insisted, you know, wait to the autopsy. You're going to see that something else was going on. There's no way that my, you know, that my wife was drunk. She didn't have any no medical issues. She may have been pre-diabetic. She was a little bit overweight. Her husband would say that she had some issues with like a tooth infection that he okay. believes was causing her severe pain. A week. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Was she ahead. a known drinker? No, no more than you and I. Social drinker. A week after the Hanson Schuler family's funerals, toxicology reports came back and revealed that Diane had a blood alcohol content of 0.19%. Whoa. That, now, that's high, Megan. Do you know how many drinks that's equivalent to? And first of all, that's twice more than twice the legal limit. It's equivalent to about 10 drinks, but there was also another six grams of alcohol in her stomach that had not yet been digested. Whoa. So we're talking about a... About 12 drinks then or something? Yeah. Oh and God. on top of that, There were also traces of THC in her body, which suggests that Diane had smoked marijuana between 15 minutes to an hour before the crash. So well, that she, might explain. But this some means of it. that she this means that she would have had to have been smoking in the car with the children, though, because they said had been she in the stopped car several times. She did. I mean, it's possible it, that it didn't capture her. Could have been. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying. Daniel and his sister Jay would become huge supporters of Diane, and they played a huge role in that documentary that I've been referencing. Neither of them would accept these findings, and they were in denial and convinced that there was an error with these toxicology reports. Did they ever rerun them? Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. So they believe that either the wrong DNA was tested or that the findings were somehow incorrect. But you and I both know that. What are the odds of that happening? I mean, it could happen, it could happen but they're but not but high. Yeah. No. Because now you have the toxicology report supporting the circumstantial evidence of, right. you know, putting the pieces together of what looks like happened. So knowing the state that Diane was in during the crash, once this toxicology report was made public, there was a lot of controversy between those who supported her, her family, and those who vilified her, basically strangers who called her a reckless drunk. People were pissed off. There were 11 victims, seven of which lost their lives in this crash. It was very important to the victims' families, particularly Daniel, to understand what had happened. And when investigating the events that took place on the way home from the campground, All of the workers from each place were visited. Remember that she stopped at McDonald's and the gas station. Mm -hmm. So first you have the campground owner who said nothing seemed wrong with Diane when they were checking out. They had an exchange. The family goes to this campground a lot. So she was friendly with the campground owners. And they said, no, she seemed she didn't seem drunk. Everyone seemed happy and well. The gas station employee said that Diane looked sober. She did ask for that fast acting pain medication. And other than that, you know, she wasn't slurring. She didn't smell like alcohol. Okay. But isn't it true if you drink vodka, you don't always, vodka is like the least smelly alcohol. Yeah, it doesn't smell. And if she mixed it with orange juice, Yeah, you know. Yeah. So Daniel starts making up excuses. Oh, this makes sense. She stopped at the gas station to get Tylenol because she probably had this really bad toothache. And then she had to self-medicate because she was in such excruciating pain. So Daniel says, well, 
Maybe she drank the vodka because she was in such excruciating pain and nobody had her pain meds. He's really, I feel bad for him. His life is destroyed. He's really trying to. And he doesn't understand, so. Yeah. So this vodka, why, you know, why did she have vodka in her car while driving? Well, Daniel says, just like anyone else, they would go camping and they would keep a bottle of vodka in the camper, which I think is perfectly normal. And he says, you know, when they were packing up, it maybe just ended up in his car rather than the camper. He can't really explain it. But he he does say that they did have that bottle of vodka on the camping trip. Okay. So at least that can help us understand. Maybe she didn't stop on the way to get the vodka. She had it already in Mm -hmm. her possession. Okay. The McDonald's employee. The McDonald's employee said that Schuler was not intoxicated, saying that they had a lengthy conversation while she waited for the food. And this is strange because the events between this McDonald's stop and receiving the eyewitness reports of the van driving erratically, like what happened in between that? She got orange juice at McDonald's. I'm just saying the possibility. If you want to know what happened, she got a drink and she poured the vodka in and that's kicked it off and she was drinking it heavily possibly but if you look at this timeline like this is happening pretty quickly and, That's of, true. and of course we know you, you could chug the vodka quick and she kept getting sick and maybe she kept drinking after throwing up like who knows what was going on but really the most puzzling thing is nobody was aware of diane having an addiction problem before this accident so this is something that made the whole event even more surprising and confusing because if this was somebody that had a drinking problem or you know it started by diane never drank and then people would say yeah she was a social drinker And then it was, Diane never smoked. Okay, she smoked to help herself fall asleep at night. So there was, it sounds like the family was trying to protect her image. Then, of course, they interviewed coworkers and friends, and no one ever said they reported seeing her wasted or having any issues with alcohol or drugs. But we'll talk about this more at the end when we talk about what we think happened. Okay. Megan, have you ever heard of the synergistic effect? Because I'm wondering if that came into effect here. As we mentioned, Diane had at least 10 drinks in her system, but and she had THC in her system, indicating that she had smoked within 15 minutes to an hour prior to the crash. Now, the synergistic effect is when there's an interaction of two or more drugs. What this does is that it'll cause the total effect to be greater than each individual effect. So in other words, someone might be able to have 10 drinks and be okay, smoke two joints and be okay. But when you put them together, it could be especially dangerous. Yes. And of course- combining any substance and driving increases how dangerous this could be. So if Diane was not used to maybe combining the two, it's possible it had a more severe effect than she had had in the past. Maybe she was able to drink 10 drinks and drive. That's possible in the past. Maybe she's done that, but maybe she didn't also smoke the marijuana. Maybe that's what you know, put her over the edge. I mean, this is weird. Something's not adding up, but okay, keep going. Not that I'm condoning drinking 10 drinks, but I'm just saying it's possible that someone who's a functional alcoholic might, you know, their tolerance is different than you or I. You or I would not be able to operate a vehicle if we had 10 drinks. No. (laughs) Or anything. (laughs) So for a woman who barely drank, according to most reports, how could she have ingested so much alcohol in such a short amount of time? And why would she put her children and nieces in such danger? Are you asking? I, it's kind of like a rhetorical. I don't know. Do you have an answer? <laughs> I mean, of course, if she was an alcoholic, that's the answer. Um, but I don't know, based on what you're saying yet, if she was. And I'd like to hear what the, you know, the rerunning of the tests maybe showed. Okay. Before we get to that, I want to talk about the legal aftermath, because there was oh. quite a legal aftermath. It's actually hard to believe how many lawsuits were filed in this case. Who are they filing against? Well, Everyone. Oh, it's tragic because if you think about it, I believe that people just need to feel some sort of closure when something like this happens. It's so tragic. So what do you do? You can't bring back your loved ones. You just need to find answers. There are years and years and large amounts of money spent trying to point the finger. So there's a lot here. I'm going to try to keep it simple. So let's start five months after the accident. The Bastardi family, the family of the three men, They filed the lawsuit against the Schulers. Now, that was settled within months for an undisclosed amount. So that was an easy one. During the years after the crash, though, there were multiple lawsuits filed by the Schuler family, the Hans family, the Bastardi family, as well as Dean and Angela Tallarico. Now, they were the occupants of the second car that was hit who had minor injuries. Oh, okay. In 2009, a wrongful death suit was filed against the Schuler estate and Warren Hans by the sister of Guy Bastardi and the daughter of Michael Bastardi. They claim that Schuler operated the vehicle in a negligent manner, which of course she did. She was intoxicated and high. 
And because of that, you know, they cause the death of their loved ones. But why include Warren here? That's what I was going to, why? They're saying that he didn't take reasonable actions to stop her? So they, it's twofold. Number one, they say that he should have known or that he may have known that his sister had a problem, but still let her operate the vehicle. And because it was his car, perhaps, I read. Oh, which, I see. Oh, man. Which leave the poor guy alone. Yeah, I mean. Like, I understand why you want to file it against the Schuler estate, but I leave, do the, too. leave the Hans family alone. In July of 2001, this was around the time when there's a two-year wrongful death statute of limitations, and it's about to expire. So this is where you see many lawsuits quickly getting filed. So Daniel Schuler filed a lawsuit against the state of New York, alleging that the car accident was caused by insufficient warning signs on the highway's exit and that it was the negligent roadway design that made the identification of the appropriate lanes difficult for Diane. That seems meritless. He claimed that this negligence resulted in the death of his daughter and wife and major injuries to his son. I mean, I feel bad for this guy. He I, lost half his family. I feel but, terrible for him, but I think that's probably not a yeah. substantial claim. I absolutely agree. I don't think that that is a substantial claim. It gets much worse. Okay. Daniel Schuler also filed a suit against Warren Hans, his brother-in-law, the brother-in-law who lost three children. Why? Saying he should have known too? I mean, is he this claimed, another? He claimed that Hans was responsible partially for the car accident since he was the owner of the minivan that Diane was driving. Oh, this is getting ugly. Yeah, it's really, I those two were, and yeah. again, Daniel Schuler's a victim here. I feel for him. But I don't think, especially filing against Warren Hans, oh, I don't no, like that. No, Jackie Hans, the mother of the three of Diane's nieces, Katie, Allison, and Emma, she filed a lawsuit alleging that her daughters had suffered, quote, pre-impact fear and terror, fear of impending death, extreme horror, and mental anguish. Now, I think we can all agree that that's a founded claim. Yeah. Then we have Daniel Longo's brother, Joseph, who sued for the wrongful death of his brother against the Schuler estate and again, Warren Hans. Wow, this poor guy. Guy Bastardi was also sued on various accounts for his unapparent effort to avoid the car accident. Now, Guy Bastardi was driver of yeah. the vehicle with the three men. Yes. So these lawsuits were made in an attempt to secure the settlement from his insurance carrier. They're blaming this guy? I mean, give me a break. They're suing this guy who was a victim and he passed away. You know, people are suing him because, you know, they want to get his estate money. Not wow. surprisingly, these suits were dismissed. But I did want to bring it up because I think it is ridiculous because what could this man have done to avoid a vehicle heading Straight on at him at 80 miles an hour. No, most of these sound like um, frivolous claims. Not all, but most. Most of them, yes. Yeah. Daniel Schuler continued to defend his wife's character, and he hired a former NYPD detective as a private investigator. The purpose of this was he wanted to clear his wife's name. He wanted to look back at the toxicology, prove that it was Diane's DNA that was used. Not surprisingly to most people. The private detective simply stated that, quote, the fact of the matter is that she was drunk and high at the time of the accident. She drove the wrong way, 1.7 miles, and she killed seven innocent people. Had she survived the accident, she'd be in jail today. And Daniel Schuler fired him. Well, he didn't get the answers he wanted. The crash was ultimately ruled a homicide, making Diane a murderer. But the families of the victims, they really wanted more. They wanted the Schuler family to admit that they knew more about Diane's issues. They felt that they needed that closure. They wanted Daniel Schuler to take responsibility. And I'm not, I don't know that that's fair. It's possible that he was covering up for his wife. It's also possible that he truly didn't know the extent to which she had a problem. You know, I mean, people who are alcoholics and suffer from alcoholism also are adaptable at covering that up. And let's not forget, he lost his wife his daughter and his three nieces. And he has a son who has, you know, medical issues and medical yeah. complications from this. So it's hard to, you know, think anything of him other than that he's a, you know, he's a victim here. Okay, so for years, Daniel Schuler continued to try to clear Diane's name, insisting that it was a medical emergency that was to blame for her actions and that she was certainly not a murderer. He also describes in the documentary that his extended family is quite split on whether or not Diane was responsible for the accident. Now, the Hans family, the family that lost the three girls, they remained pretty quiet. They did not participate in the documentary. But in 2011, there was an article titled, The Worst Has Happened, Life After the Death of My Children. Oh. Yeah. In this article, Jackie Hans shared that she and her husband decided to try having another baby after losing all three of their girls. Jackie had previously had her tubes tied, which means that she wouldn't be able to have children again. However, there was a doctor who, like a um, fertility doctor, who offered services pro bono. 
and helped Jackie with in vitro fertilization. And she was able to get pregnant. And they called this, quote, a message from God. And in this article, when they were asked how they feel about Diane, Jackie Hans responded with, quote, how does a person go from being like a sister to me, adored by my girls and cherished by my husband, to being the one who ruined our lives? To not have the answer is torture. And Warren added, quote, when something terrible happens, your brain simply can't process it, or at least mine couldn't. For the first month, I was so dazed with grief that I'd wander out of my room and out of the house at all hours. I don't know what I was doing. Searching for the girls, question mark, end quote. So this is heartbreaking. Yeah, I have no idea how one would respond to that kind of trauma. No. I'm so glad to hear they went on to have another child. Yeah, they did have a baby girl and they leave, you know, they lead a pretty quiet life as far as I know. So Megan, theories, I mean, there's nothing to say about the system here. The perpetrator um, is deceased. Had she survived, she would be in jail for homicide. I think so. So the way I see it, and I want to hear your explanations, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you... I believe there are four possible explanations here, okay. and I'm curious what you think. Number one, I think it could have been deliberate intoxication, whereby she was potentially a functional alcoholic. Now, functional alcoholism, it's also known as high-functioning alcoholism. It's when someone is struggling with alcohol dependence, but they don't really show the outside signs of addiction. And remember, by all accounts, she was a good employee, a loving mother. She was doing what she needed to do to be a productive citizen. So what do you what do you know about functional alcoholism, Megan? I know a couple of people who are or were functional alcoholics, and it's true. They can function at a very high level, and you just can't see the signs of it, to be honest. So I think that's entirely possible. Okay, so you think this is a feasible explanation? It's feasible, yes. What if I tell you that there was no forensic evidence of long-term alcohol abuse, such as an enlarged liver... Or, you know, is it possible that she could have only recently begun abusing alcohol? Or does that make you question this theory? It's, I mean, it's all strange, right? Because you don't see the outward signs. But, you know, alcoholism is like something that you you probably, it's something you have, but you may not pick up a drink. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like you may have an addictive personality, but it's not until later on in life. And I actually do know someone who also had this addictive personality, but didn't pick up any drugs until, you know, she was in her 30s. So it's it's so it's really possible. Okay, so you think so this is possible. Now, could it have possibly been an accidental intoxication? Now, what I mean by that is maybe did something happen to push her over the edge and she needed to escape what was going on? Who knows? Did her and Daniel have a fight that morning? Did she get news about something that happened at work? So maybe she was deliberately... Did she have like a bad headache or tooth abscess or all these things you're talking about and thought like, I can ameliorate this or pacify this by using alcohol? Yeah. My tooth hurts. I'm going to have a little vodka to numb the pain. And then somehow it I don't think that's got feasible. out of hand. I don't think that's feasible given the amount. What about maybe she has that tolerance where she could drink the 10 drinks and maybe she smoked the marijuana and accidentally got herself because of the synergistic effect, accidentally got herself so inebriated? Sure. Yeah, sure. Possible. I don't I don't think that one's as strong. But again, it goes back to the idea. She had her children and nieces in the car. Did she deliberately get this drunk or accidentally get this drunk? It's, yeah. That, to me, that's the biggest question. I agree. It also could have just been a form of a psychotic break, some sort of mental health episode. So I was going to ask you if she didn't have any prior mental health issues that were that documented. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't mean she didn't suffer from any. It just means that there was nothing documented. documented. Remember, she did have quite a traumatizing past. Mm-hmm. And she did keep to herself. And she was juggling a lot. Like, who knows what was going on behind the scenes? There were some reports of her complaining about issues in her marriage. You know, they did a lot of digging, of course. Now, would something happen biologically that would be the catalyst for her to drink? Or was she drinking? And, you know, like what? It still doesn't it still doesn't really make sense, though. No. Is there another option? There are a few possible medical explanations. It could have been, you know, a blood clot, a stroke, pain from her tooth. We would think that the autopsy would have revealed if there were a stroke or some blood clot. um, It most likely would have revealed that. I believe so. And some friends and family said she had, you know, a blood clot in her leg. You know, all these other things came up. There were dental records that were pulled that did confirm that she had this abscessed tooth. But again, could that have caused her so much pain that that caused her to self-medicate or, you know, who knows? But I think the least likely explanation is something called auto brewery syndrome. I have no idea what that is. So it's also known as gut fermentation syndrome. I have no idea what that is. (laughs) (laughs) It's sometimes called the drunkenness disease. It's a very rare condition that makes you intoxicated without drinking alcohol. 
This basically happens when your body turns sugary and starchy foods, such as carbohydrates, into alcohol. Not very common and probably not likely considering they found the bottle of Absolute, but... So if there was no bottle of Absolute and no reports of her, you know, drinking before, I might be able to get on board with that. But because of the rarity of it and because of the alcohol found, I'm, I'm going to say I won't go with that. I also have to admit, I don't know enough about the syndrome to say if the autopsy, you know, they said she had undigested alcohol in her stomach. Are they able to distinguish between, you know actual alcohol and this, you know, fake alcohol or the alcohol, you know, the starch that makes it resemble alcohol. I don't know enough, but there's also one other thing. Have you ever heard of Call of the Void? Only because James mentioned it to me once, but I still wouldn't be able to tell you what it is. It's this very strange thing that I think you and most of our listeners have probably experienced. So have you ever just been standing like on a cliff or something like on the roof of a building and you look down and for a second you're like, what if I jumped? Yeah, the urge. Oh, yes. that's what it is. Oh, so they're saying if she was like driving, she just had the urge to drive um, yeah. on one way. I have heard of that and I know what happens. So in the city, there's the vessel landmark and a number of people have recently jumped off of that. So they closed it. And that's what they think. I guess that's when James probably mentioned yeah. it to me. Well, call of the void doesn't necessarily equate with suicidal ideation. So it's not that people are suicidal. It's that they get this urge and most of us can just be like, I'm so crazy. Why would I ever think of that? So is this like my urge when I get angry to hit something or hit people? (laughs) I guess so. It's the urge you have when you're driving (laughs) fast. It's the urge you have when driving fast to swerve quick. But in this case, I don't think it's relevant because a lot led up to this. It's not like Diane was driving and then all of a sudden just swerved and went into a ditch. This is a woman who it was, you know, over the course of hours that she was driving erratically and these things were happening. Now, could it have been suicide? Yes, Absolutely. And that would go along with having maybe a psychotic break because there's no signs of suicidal ideation. Again, we do know that some people die by suicide when they have no signs leading up. So it is possible that she had some of these feelings and never knew. It's it's possible suicide was also in the makes as she was drinking a lot, ingesting a lot. You know, that's some in some ways a form of intentional suicide or unintentional suicide. But why would she bring the children with her? I don't know. This is I I will tell you, Amy, hands down, probably the most mind boggling case you've brought to me that I, I can't figure out. I do think she ingested the alcohol and the drugs. I don't know if it was to you know, pacify some symptoms or if she was just, you know, she was just someone who drank a lot and then it just spiraled. But I am definitely baffled at the end of this one. Yeah. And Diane wasn't a mean or a bad person. It's hard to say she's a victim because she took so many lives, but she's a victim. She was clearly suffering from something, whether it was something biological or psychological. And she she maybe just reached an unbearable breaking point. I mean, I don't want to speculate if she's a victim or not, to be honest. For me, it's hard because I don't. I really feel like yeah. I don't know and I couldn't yeah. say. I do understand where you're going with that. Um, but listen, I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this one because truly you've left me with a lot of question marks and I'm going to watch the documentary myself. Some have speculated that on the day of the accident, remember I talked about she was supposed to get the nieces home by noon Mm -hmm. because they had a recital. Some speculate that she was really stressed about running late because she's a perfectionist, that perhaps to like ease her pain, that's why she drank and smoked and that led to the disorientation or, you know, it could... Substance use can also lead to disassociation. Absolutely. It could totally lead to disassociation. So maybe she lost touch with, re- you know, maybe ultimately she lost touch with reality. So it kind of spiraled out of control. I don't think she would do all this because she was running late. No, but there's exacerbators, right? She might have had so many other things going on. And then this was just like the straw that broke the, you know, camel's back. Like it just sparked something. Yeah. It just made me think if she was suicidal and she pulled over right before the bridge, why not leave the kids in the car and go jump off the bridge? I have no idea. That's why, like, was this premeditated? Did it just, like, this is right up there with Cindy James, I think. I was thinking that. Well, that's why I said it's the most boggling mystery you brought me. In any world, is there any way that we'll ever know what happened here? We might if someone who knew her earlier, you know, if someone came forward and said, you know, in fact, you didn't know this about Diane. So maybe we could get some insight into either her mental health or her previous substance abuse or any suicidal ideologies. So that's a possibility. I mean, short of that, I'm not really sure. But I would love to be able to solve this one in Sydney James. I was thinking about that because Daniel is the only one who probably has access to like her journals and her, you know, all of her belongings. So I'm wondering if there would be something there and he's just keeping it close to the chest because pretty much if Diane is to blame for this, he's to blame for this. 
in like the public's eye in the sense that he probably should have seen the red flags or not let her take the kids if she was having a tough day or whatever it is. In the, maybe in the public eye, I, I wouldn't necessarily blame him, especially if he didn't know. If he didn't know, then this is not his fault. Okay, Megan. Well, I can only hope that the Hans family has some peace and they're able to move on with their life and the other, the other victims' families as well. In fact, all the families. I hope all of them have found some measure of peace or comfort or, or closure. I, I can't imagine this, but I, I hope they've found something to comfort them. I would love to hear your opinion, listeners. So please feel free to reach out on social media, email us. I'm very curious what the general consensus is here. All right. Well, thank you all so much for listening. And we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show while gaining access to ad-free episodes, exclusive AMAs, and other bonus content for a small monthly contribution through Patreon. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. Sources for today's episode include CBS New York, North Point Recovery, ABC News, Lowhud.com, New York Magazine, New York Personal Injury Blog, New York Legal Blog, and Newsday. Blog and Newsday. Blog and Newsday. Blog 